Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. I've come across an oddity today that I felt was worth sharing, so take a look at this thing. It's one of those Squire Vintage Modified Jazz Master Baritone guitars. I do have separate reviews and demos on the Antigua and the Blacked Out version one, and oh my goodness, the market has changed so much since I made that video. But back when I made that video, like 800 bucks was top value. But anymore, you're lucky to find one even listed under 1200 I'm curious, do they actually sell for these amounts? Let's see. Oh my goodness, yeah. There's one that sold for 12 one that sold for 15 Looks like a 13 and a 12 yeah. That is just insane that these squires are selling for so much. But who am I to judge what people are willing to pay on the used market? So this one initially caught my eye because it's like, oh, okay, only 680 bucks. It seems like a deal as compared to everything else I was seeing. So then I was flipping through the photos, seeing like, oh, is there something wrong? Does it have like a neck pocket crack, non-original parts? What's going on with this thing to make it affordable? And then this photo hit me. A squire, you know, from the family of Fender, has a headstock repair. <laughs> <laughs> you hardly ever see this. I mean, the whole reason why Gibson headstocks break, it's because of the neck angle on them. They, they're angled back, so if you hit them, yes, they can break. But since Fender guitars aren't angled back as much, typically you don't see this too often. So when one does show up, it almost makes me want to buy it because it's just so quirky. I actually almost once bought a 50s Stratocaster simply because it had a headstock repair. I just thought that was hilarious. It's kind of hard to see where it broke. I think, is it a long line right here? And then that also bubbled up some finish right here along the skunk stripe. The good news is once it's repaired, you'll probably be just fine. But that's the reason why this one is half off. Now, I really like these guitars. I thought they were cool, but anything over like 850, I'm personally out of it because there are a lot of other baritones you can get. However, if I'm remembering correctly, aren't these a 30 inch scale length? There's not too many guitars like that. But that's the number two best selling baritone guitar on reverb right now, and it's out of production. That's just crazy. And even the Squire Paranormal Baritone Cabernita Tellies are starting to inflate in price. It's difficult to find them new anymore, and usually the ones that show up on reverb or at least a couple hundred dollars more than brand new. So it's all just a supply and demand thing. I think Fender needs to make more baritone guitars. It's nice that we have some options now though. But next up here, I saw one of the uncommon Gibson Vegas high rollers today. I did videos on the high roller and the standard version of these a few years ago. You can check them out if you want. But what particularly made this one look nice is just the top on it. It's one of the nicest looking ones I've seen. It's not necessarily like a crazy flame top, but it's got a lot of figuring and movement in it. Every angle that you look at this thing, I mean, straight on, it's got some good stuff. From this angle, that's where it's starting to look really beautiful. And I was tempted to actually purchase this thing and do like an updated review and demo because they kind of got that Firebird-esque headstock going on. These are gold colored frets. It's kind of hard to see in the photos, but they also have the ebony fret boards with the mother of pearl block inlays. They're a cool guitar, maybe not my favorite, but they're quirky and they were only made for a couple of years. But then when you get to the back of this one, I was looking at the neck and it's like, is that figuring on the neck? Yes, please. And yeah, it appears it at least has a little bit, maybe not a lot, but that is definitely a nice neck back here. But here you can see the special pearl tip tuners that these things got. And if you're curious how these things are made, it's not quite an ES styled instrument. It's more like the Midtown series where they just chamber out a mahogany body and give it F holes. But right when I was about to make an offer on it, that's when I saw this. So this thing was definitely played quite a bit, but somebody's pinky has been rubbing against the finish and it wore through. So if you like that naturally relic vibe for these, you've got that option. Looks like the seller's saying, hey, you could add a pick guard if you hate that. And I don't know how I feel about that particular one, but I'm sure a custom pick guard on this would actually look pretty cool. Kind of reminds me of a troublemaker telly for some reason, but these are flat tops. And it still has the original case, and oh my, yeah, that top's really coming to life there. Looks like he's top-wrapped the strings. So how much was he wanting for this piece? $2,210 and $75 shipping. The thing with the high rollers is they are hard to find. There's usually not too many on the market, and when they do show up, they're one of the red finishes, which is great if you like red. But finding the purple one and the felt green can be a bit difficult. 
It looks like the past ones have sold between 15 to 2,000. They can hit the high twos. Sometimes I think this one's tying in with like the Vegas standards, but they're just kind of a quirky model if you want something a little bit different, kind of like an offset 335 from the Midtown series, I guess you could call them. Next up today, I found this Les Paul Standard Deluxe Limited Edition 1977. Now this is a case of a seller was likely misled, he believed it, and now he's feeding the story on. So he's saying this is sold as is, and it is a limited edition of a Les Paul Standard Deluxe from 1977. He says the snake is not a label, the switches came as you see when he bought it from the last owner 30 years ago. As with many deluxes, this guitar came with this big humbuckers. Okay, so what I'm getting from this is he's claiming this is factory original 100% just like this. It came with these switches and it had humbuckers. While in the early 70s, it was possible to find Les Paul deluxes that came stock from the factory with humbuckers. This is not one of them. And this iguana monster on the front, that's definitely been airbrushed at some point in time. And all these little mini toggle switches here, they're not original either. You can tell that these pickups aren't original because of these little holes right Right here. So at one point in time, somebody took this Les Paul Deluxe and routed it out and added some artwork to it. So to call this a limited edition is unfortunately misleading here, because this is just a regular old Les Paul Deluxe from 1977, going by its serial number. But hey, we've got the original tuners, and maybe they actually did put some nice T-top pickups in here. Looks like we're still on the original frets, still have the original truss rod cover. The headstock looks quite nice. It's from the maple neck era. You've got a little bit of buckle worming and rash on here. I can't say the sea monster design is very attractive to me, but hey, somebody might dig it. And who knows what these mini toggle switches do for those pickups. And it looks like this has a three piece top and this piece just happens to have a little bit of flame. Oh cool, he did show us some photos. Yeah, that's 100% not original because these pickups did not exist yet. You don't start seeing the Gibson USA base plate until as early as around 1993 is when they start swapping over into these, transitioning into it. It looks like it says 490R, so likely a 498T in the bridge. Yep, and that's further proof right here that this started life as a deluxe because somebody has professionally routed these to have the additional little poles right there so they can screw into them. So how much is he wanting for this? He's starting to come down within reason. When he was asking 3,000 bucks saying it's all original, nah, that's not gonna happen. But now that this is getting, you know, closer to the $2,000 range, I mean, you gotta remember, this is also in Spain. There's not a lot of options over there if you're looking for a 70s Les Paul. So for Spain's market, this is not the worst price in the world, especially since he's still open to some offers. And if you're within Spain, you're not gonna have this crazy shipping price. So if you could pick it up for like 18 to 21, you'd probably be okay in this particular market. And next up, we have another lesson to teach here. This is also from Spain, signed guitars. A lot of people think, especially with Les Paul himself, the man himself, when he signs something, they think the guitar's value goes crazy because we see all these charity auctions all the time or their prizes on radio shows. Here's the thing. Generally, signed guitars are not worth any more than just the base model. In fact, sometimes it devalues it. It depends who signed it, if you have proof of who signed it, and how it's being sold. If you're just selling it as a layman, normally there's no premium here. This is just a 1996 SG Special. It's maybe worth, at max, like 900 to 1,000 bucks, but this guy wants 20 grand. <laughs> Now this one being signed by the members of ACDC, what was that back in 1996 he's telling us, apparently also has the full story with pictures and proof of authenticity of these. I don't know why he can't just upload it to his reverb page and it has to be private message. Maybe he just doesn't want his face in it, I get that. But he could also just like block it out if he had a photo editor. So in this case, if you find a huge ACDC fan, they might pay you like a $500 premium for this, like $1,400 for this piece. But how guitars like these sell for a lot in charity auctions is just because people are being charitable. It's a common misconception when people start getting into guitar trading and stuff, especially on Les Paul's signature. Les Paul, he signed just about anything anyone would hand to him. So his signature generally does not bring any type of a premium. But if you've got a pick car that you're selling that he had it, yeah, it's, it's still worth a couple hundred bucks, but it's not going to be life-changing amounts of money like some people think. So $20,000 for this, unfortunately, no, that will never sell. I don't even think it would sell for a tenth of that price. 
But anyways, troglodytes, thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.